current affairs. So we'll be discussing the monthly like important topics from October. So I'll give you a glimpse of all the important topics which we will be dealing right now. In polity, we have the Digital India Act, Schedules Act. There was an important uh, article in the text section. Then Delimitation Commission, Fact Check Unit, the abortion laws, police reform, special and local laws, Lok Sabha Ethics Committee and Parliamentary Standing Committee. That's important topics from our polity. Then moving on to economy, we have the concept of circular migration, global wealth tax, National Financial Reporting Agency, Tradable Green Credits and Middle Income Chart. We, have, we need to know about the key terms. Then for the environment, we have the Glacier Lake outburst phenomena which happened in the Sikkim. So we have, we have discussed about that. The National Action Plan for Green Shipping, Gangatic Dolphins, Asiatic Wild Dog, Pain Percept and Conical. These are the important species that have been mentioned in the news. Then we are looking into the international relations, we have some of the key terms like we have deals about Mo uh, Moscow format, we have deal about the Indian Ocean Rim Association, CTBT Act, then Israel Hamas, the conflict which is actually going on, we have the recent BRI summit which happened in October, then Global Gender Gap Report, Global Hunger Index, Serbia, Kosovo, also there is some conflict happening there, ethnic conflict, so we will look into that too. Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relationship, International Solar Alliance and an important topic, who Southeast Asia membership, there are region member, uh, regional membership groups within who itself, so we will be looking into that as well. Then moving on to science and tech, we have some uh, key artificial intelligence terminologies like multimodal AI, Namo Bharat, artificial general intelligence, we have the white phosphorus bombs which was actually used by Israel in Gaza, so we need to deal about the white phosphorus bombs as well. Dark patterns, India mobile co uh, congress, cloud seeding, R21 metrics vaccine and an important term gravity battery. Then moving on to uh, like defense, we have project Udbhav, Astra missile, positive indigenization list, Indo-Tibetan border police force, territorial army, IAF new ensign, then Iron Drone also in IAF, you have to discuss about the uh, Air Force Day which was celebrated in October. There were a lot of key changes that happened in the Air Force parade that took place this year. So we will be discussing about that as well. Iron Dome system as well as MQ-9B drones which India is like has approved for the purchase. Then in history we have the key terminologies like Katha Prasangam, Garba Flog Dance, Durga Puja as well as an important personality Nai Kishan Gadge. So in our words, we have a lot of Nobel Prize in PE, in medicine, physics and such. We will be discussing all the Nobel, Nobel Prizes, EU Human Rights Prize as well as Saraswati Samman. So this is the index. These are how much topics. There are 55 topics and about 60 questions that I will be discussing within this session. Now moving on, we will be first taking about quality. So the first is consider the following statements about the Digital India Act 2023. It is a legal framework for the country's digital ecosystem aims to shape the future and country cyber landscape. It is a move by the Ministry of Electronics and IT. So if you are looking at the Digital India Act of 2030, it is indeed the uh, initiative that is taken by the Ministry of Electronics and IT. This is actually to reform the country's digital ecosystem and it will be actually amending the IT Act of 2000. The thing is that the IT Act was actually initiated in 2000 and no big reforms were actually made. But within the time frame like the number of mobile users or the internet users or the people who have started using all this kind of digital networks has drastically increased. If you are looking at the 23 years, there was a jump from about 5.5 million users to about 850 million users. So this is kind of high time where we are actually bringing some reforms so that the consumer will be actually protected, there is user interface, there is no cyber bullying happening. So altogether the modern 21st century problems regarding the digital age will be actually resolved through using this act. So if you are looking at the four major priority areas that has been mentioned in this act is we have the online safety and trust act so that we, we will be safeguarding the citizens right from any kind of cyber bullying as such. Then accessibility, open internet so that internet availability is there for every single person. Then guiding emerging technology because we have the artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, then IoT and such a lot of fields in the digital economy is actually coming up. So we need some kind of regulation so that we can actually bring in some kind of ethics to this artificial intelligence, this machine learning, data privacy as such. Then renew, we need to safe harbor the principle between the platform because even our user is putting some kind of uh, like statements or something within the platforms like Facebook and something, this Facebook as a platform is not viable to what the user is actually putting. So we need to actually renew or change the kind of safe harbor principles. So that is some of the four major priority areas. So if you are looking at this question, 
what are the uh, about the Digital India Act of 2023? Singles Act is a legal framework for the country's digital ecosystem and aims to receive that is actually a correct statement. Then it is a move by the Maiti, it is also a correct statement. So which of the following is a correct? Both statement 1 and statement 2 is actually, uh, two is a correct explanation of statement 1. A is the correct answer here. Moving on to the next topic, we have our India's scheduled areas. So article 244 deals with the admission of scheduled tribes and scheduled areas. Then the governor notifies and declares the scheduled areas. Debar and Guria Commission deals with the scheduled area. We need to select the number of correct statements. So the article 244 indeed deals with the admission of the scheduled areas and such. So if you are looking article 244 is divided into article 244 1 which deals with the fifth schedule areas and article 244 2 which actually deals with Assam, Meghalaya and Tripura. We have 244 2. Article 2 which deals with the sixth schedule areas. You know which all the states are there in the sixth schedule. We have Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura and Mizoram are the sixth schedule states and these states are coming under Article 244.2, whereas the application of fifth schedule comes in the 2441. So that is which we will be dealing about here. Also, it is not the governor but the president who actually declares the scheduled areas. Where it comes to the management, the governor actually deals with it, but the president actually declares the scheduled areas. Then we have the two commission which actually deals with the areas of scheduled commission which have given recommendations. One is the Debar Commission report in 1961 as well as the Guria Commission report in 1995. Both these deal with the reforms that has been taken in the scheduled area. So if you are looking at the Debar Commission report, the guide norms for declaring an area as a scheduled area. Preponderance of the tribal population, the compactness, the reasonable size of the area. Now presently as such we do not have particular criteria under which we have to declare the scheduled areas. But the Zeba Commission report has actually given out certain criteria by which we can actually identify this scheduled areas. Then we have the Guria Commission, they also recommend the provision for the extension of that PESA. This is about the PESA, uh, extension, extension of Panjayat to scheduled areas that what has been recommended by the Buria Commission. So if you are looking at the uh, question now, Article 244 deals with the admission of scheduled and tribal areas, that is a correct statement. Governor notifies and declares scheduled area, that is wrong. It is actually declared by President. Then Debar and Buria Commission deals with the scheduled areas, that is also correct statement. So we had to choose the number of correct statements, only two statements are correct here. Then consider the following statements about the delimitation commission. So the delimitation commission in India has been constituted four times in India. The delimitation commission consists of retired judges of the Supreme Court or High Court, Chief Election Commissioner and Cabinet Minister. Then the orders of the delimitation commission cannot be questioned in any court. So let us we had to choose the number of incorrect statements. So let us look into it. So when we are dealing with the delimitation commission, the uh, like election commission defines delimitation commission as like it is the process of drawing boundaries or constituencies for elected bodies so that they can actually consider how much of population, all the constituencies, the population, the number of votes coming, everything will be actually same. So as per article 81, it is actually the ratio between the number of seats or the population in the state so far by practice it should be same in everything. And as per article 82 which actually defines the delimitation commission after every census is completed, the allocation of Lok Sabha seat to each state must be actually adjusted based upon the population changes. So all this article talks about the delimitation commission. So in India delimitation commission has actually taken place four times in 1952, 1963 and 1973 and then in 2002. By the 42nd constitutional amendment act this delimitation commission was actually froze for the next 25 years and the next delimitation actually took place in 2002 and then this was seat was frozen again till 2026. So the next delimitation commission will actually come in 2026. Last it happened in 2020, 2002 and then it was actually froze for the next 25 years. The delimitation commission consists up of the retired judges of Supreme Court and High Court, the Chief Election Commission and the State Election Commissioner. So what are the recommendations that has been made by the delimitation commission should be imposed and it is actually cannot be. There is no judicial review and cannot be drawn upon to the court of law. So if you are looking from the statements here, we can see that the Delimitation Commission in India have been constituted four times. We looked in 1952, 1962, the 1973 and in 2002. Only four times the Delimitation Commission actually came in India. 
then delimitation commission consider retired judges of supreme court and high court that is correct chief election commissioner that is correct but not the cabinet minister we have the state election commissioner so the second statement is wrong the orders of the delimitation cannot be questioned in any court of law see we have the two statements which is correct we need to choose the incorrect statement so here only one statement is actually incorrect then moving on to the next question we have consider the following statements about the parliamentary standing committee the parliamentary committee draws their authority from the constitution the parliament uh, like the parliamentary standing committees are ad hoc in nature and are constituted by the parliament to deal with specific areas of public policy the sma committee consists of only member only members from the lok sabha and are elected for a period of one year we need to choose the incorrect statement so if you are looking at the parliamentary standing committee these are indeed drawn up from the constitution articles 105 and 118 deals about the standing committees or the parliamentary committees in general and they draw their authority from the constitution there are like parliamentary committees are two types one is standing committees which are permanent in nature then ad hoc committees that are temporary in nature so the parliamentary standing committees are permanent in nature and they are not temporary or ad hoc then the name of three important committees which you know need to know is estimate committees only like consist of 13 member 30 members and they are only drawn from the lok sabha it is the ex, uh, estimates or expenditure of the government so the rajya sabha is actually not included only the lok sabha is actually included you need to remember estimate committee consists of 30 members wholly drawn from lok sabha then the other committees public account committees and the committees of public undertaking for both of this there is actually mixed number of members that are selected from the lok sabha as well as the rajya sabha there are total of 22 members 15 will be actually drawn from the lok sabha and 7 will be drawn from the rajya sabha for all this they are actually elected for a period of 1 year so these are the three important committees we are estimate committee as i have told you wholly drawn from the lok sabha it consists of 30 members and the others 22 members which are drawn from both the lok sabha as well as the rajya sabha so now moving back to the question so consider the following statements about the parliamentary standing committee the parliamentary standing committee draws their power from the constitution that is absolutely correct as i have told you they draw their power from article 105 as well as article 118 then the parliamentary standing committees are ad hoc in nature as i have told you they are, they are permanent and not ad hoc this means temporary so the second statement is absolutely wrong the estimate committee consists only of the members from lok sabha and are elected for a period of one year that statement is also true we need to choose a number of incorrect statements so here only one statement is actually incorrect so moving on to the next topic we have consider the following statements about the special and local laws these are special laws that cover specific issues that are mentioned or covered in the penal codes like for example like excise gambling railway side extra comes under this <coughs> So let's looking into the special and local laws. These are laws which are actually created for some specific purpose. Now these laws which are actually created does not come the certain topics like like gambling or the railways. They are not actually mentioned on the IPC or the Criminal Procedure Code or any other codes. So certain laws or areas which are not mentioned in the IPC are made into special and local laws. Special laws are that which are actually not mentioned in the IPC and local laws are that as actually created for a certain area like supposedly port trust. For specifically that port. a certain laws has me for so this local laws are applicable to that fortress or special areas only local areas only it's not applicable throughout throughout india so special laws are the ones which are actually not mentioned in the ipc or criminal procedure code and we have the local laws which are applicable to certain areas only the problem is that the ipc even though we are actually renewing the special and the local laws are actually not getting renewed and because of this majority like 40 percentage of the, all the cases that was registered in 2021 were under the special and local laws because 40 percentage of these cases like the detail or the condi- or the terminology was actually not mentioned in ipc because of which we were actually want to create the laws in this special and local laws so that is which important here so if you are looking at the question these are special laws that cover specific issues that are mentioned or covered in the penal codes so that statement is actually wrong as i have told you the special laws they actually cover the areas that are not mentioned in the ipc or the criminal procedure code laws made for excise gambling railways etc comes under this because even uapa posco such acts were actually created out of this ipc because the sexual uh, like sexual assault of the uh, child 
or the UAPA, like certain terminologies like the organized crime or terrorism, these were actually not mentioned in the IPC. So because of which we need to actually create a special laws. So that is what is called. So we need to choose the number of correct statements. Here the first statement is wrong, only statement 2 is actually correct. Moving on, consider the following statements about the ethics committee for the members of the parliament. The members of ethics committee are appointed by the president. Any person can file a complaint against a member of parliament without the need for an evidence or an affidavit. We need to select the number of correct statements. So the thing is that the ethics committee recently a person in the Lok Sabha was actually acquitted uh, on the statement that she was actually asking questions in the Lok Sabha for gaining money. So that has been actually recommended, this problem has been actually recommended to the ethics committee. So this ethics committee is not appointed by the president but by the speaker for a period of one year. This ethics committee is recommended or appointed by the speaker for a period of one year. The functions include that they examine the complaints of unethical conduct like similarly what has been actually the example I gave you that is an unethical conduct in the Lok Sabha. So certain kind of complaints will be actually entertained by the special ethics committee. Then they make recommendation to the speaker and formulate the code of conduct for the members of the Lok Sabha as well as the Raj Sabha also. They suggest amendments for the addition of code of conduct to Raj Sabha. So all these are the functions of the ethics committee in ethics committee and is appointed by not the president but by the speaker for a period of one year. The thing is that if you have a complaint against an enemy, you need to have proper evidence or an affidavit. You just cannot go and just acquaint the person like stating that I doubt that this person did some unethical and you need to complain. The committee won't actually entertain such kind of request. You need to have proper evidence and affidavit relating to that unethical conduct that has been done by the person. But if I myself, I did something unethical, I myself am going and complaining the ethics committee means you, de you need not have any kind of evidence or affidavit. I am myself handing over to the ethics committee stating that I have done something unethical. So these are the two kind of conditions that comes under this procedure of complaints. The committee presents a report to the speaker who has the house, like they can actually put a half an hour session for the discussion of the report in the unethical conduct itself. They can actually take up half an hour discussion for that and the house reports should be taken up for consideration. Whatever the report that has been handed by the ethics committee should be actually considered as well and half an hour can be actually uh, can be put forward for the discussion on the report as well. So the members of ethics committee are appointed by the president. The first statement is wrong. It is actually appointed by the speaker. Any person can file a complaint against an MP without the need for evidence that is also wrong. We need to choose the number of correct statements here, neither one nor two because both the statements are wrong here. Moving on, consider the following statement about abortion laws. The right to make reproductive choice is explicitly mentioned in the article 21. Women in India regardless of the marital status can undergo abortion up to 24 weeks into pregnancy to access safe and legal abortions. So if you are looking at the chronologies of how the abortion laws have actually gone in India, we are looking at the British time in the section 312 of the IPC, such kind of abortion even with the uh, even with the access or the request of the pregnant lady, even if I give the consent for the, I should actually undergo abortion, that was actually treated as a criminal offence, you should not actually undergo criminal offence. So that was even causing voluntary miscarriage was actually considered criminalized. Then Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act 1971, MTRP uh, Act which actually came in 1971. Now this was actually liberalized some kind of abortion, it was actually considered into 12, 0 to 12 weeks <coughs> you can undergo abortion with the, with the accent of opinion of only one doctor. Like you can undergo, there was given a choice for the woman so that you can actually undergo abortion. But from 0 to 12 weeks, you need the opinion of one doctor to undergo abortion. After 12 weeks, you need the opinion of two doctors was actually needed. In actually 2021, this was actually further liberalized. From 0 to 20 weeks, there was actually given from 0 to 20 weeks. Then 20 to 24 weeks. And then after 24 weeks. 0 to 20 weeks, it's your wish. If you need to undergo abortion, you can with the recommendation of one doctor. There is no kind of conditionality that is available for women. You can undergo abortion on your choice. Then 20 to 24 weeks, 
the right to seek uh, abortion. It's a medical plan, panel is uh, actually recommended. Then there is actually certain kind of conditions which actually come if we need to undergo the abortion. Like in between 24 to 20 weeks and such, if you need to undergo abortion, the thing is that it's not very easy. You need the opinion of multiplicity of doctors and you should be actually a victim of rape or you should be a minor in, in case of such kind of natural disasters or something because of which you cannot undergo the pregnancy further. In such kind of conditions only, the pregnancy termination will be actually allowed within 20 to 24 weeks. Then after 24 weeks, it requires the medical board. It is not under your wish. From 0 to 20, uh, 20 weeks, it's wholly the woman's choice to undergo abortion. From 20 to 24 weeks, you can undergo emotion, abortion. That is also a choice of woman. That the presence of movement choice is there. But after 24 weeks, the child, the baby starts developing. We can actually see the heartbeats, heartbeats and such. So the thing is that the abortion is not the choice of the woman alone now. The abortion, if need to be continued, will be actually approved by the medical board and the Supreme Court. You can see the case, the 26 week old woman, week old woman who actually wants to undergo abortion. You have seen a lot of cases that is happening related to it. So it's not an easy and it's not the choice of the woman alone at this time. So that is how the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act has been actually evolved over time. Till 24 weeks, it's still easy to get abortion. Now, Consider the following statements about the abortion laws. The right to make uh, reproductive choices explicitly mentioned in Article 21. You have the choice to make, uh, like you have the choice to make abortion, but it's not explicitly mentioned. Here, this term is actually making the entire sentence wrong. The term explicitly is not actually mentioned. You have the Article 21. You have the right to life and liberty under which we can actually undergo abortion. Like the abortion right to abortion is actually not explicitly mentioned in Article 21. So the first statement is wrong. Now, women in India, regardless of marital status, for the married woman as well as unmarried woman, they can actually undergo abortion up to 24 weeks. That is correct. So, in this, we have the statement 1 is incorrect and statement, statement 2 is correct. So, that is the answer for this question. In India, you should also know that we actually follow a pro-choice kind of pregnancy. There is pro-choice versus pro-life. The thing is that in India, we look for the choice, we have choice that is actually given for women. For a woman, you can actually undergo pregnancy, like abort pregnancy or you can actually go ahead with the pregnancy. That is a choice, that is a pro-choice kind of initiative that is actually given for women. But if you are looking pro-life, the thing is that even developed country like US, they follow the pro-life kind of thing. The thing is that they look for the life or the right of the unborn child. So that is a pro-life concept, concept that you cannot undergo abortion because that is against the right of the child. So that is the pro-life kind of concept. In India, we actually focus mainly on pro-choice, but this per certain decision that was actually taken by the Supreme Court was actually pro-life. That was looking at the life of the unborn child because the child already had heartbeat. And if you are actually going for abortion, it will be equaling to murdering the child or killing the child. That is why the in the humanitarian grounds, the Supreme Court took a choice based on pro-life, looking at the rights of the unborn child also, rather than a pro-choice that is actually given to the woman. So now, moving on to our next question, we have uh, considered the following statements about the fact check unit. The fact check unit is established by the Ministry of Home Affairs. The focus is to identify the fake online content related to the business of the central government. So the fact check unit is actually not by the Ministry of Home Affairs, but by the Ministry is established by Ministry of Electronics and IT, which amending the IT rules of 2021. Now, this is to mainly to flag the fake news and other online new fake news, especially about the government that is actually going on within the economy. So, the rules require intermediaries. The thing is that we have a user, we have a platform. The thing is that me as a user, I am using platforms such as Facebook or Insta. And I am posting fake news, negative content, hate speech and such. The thing is that I am liable and the people who are even liking my comment or coming, com uh, commenting, under my, uh, commenting under my post is also liable. The thing is that we are spreading fake news such. But this is actually posted in platforms such as Facebook, such as Instagram and such. The thing is that the government says that safe harboring is there in the case of platform because what all is actually posted here, the platform is actually not liable. They are not even blocking my account or blocking the spread of the hate news. So in such a fact checking unit, the platform scrutiny will also come under this. Recently, till, till now this uh, 
anything for the platform was actually not there. Even if I am posting a hate comment or a very negative message, the platform was actually not liable. But under the new fact checking unit and such, the platforms will be actually equally liable even if I am using it. So such a fake message or blocking should also be controlled. Now the amendment changes the rule of IT rules, deals with the intermediate put, put them under obligation. The intermediate such as these platform will be also put under obligation to ensure that the user do not publish fake data. But the problem here is that what is this fake data? What is this misleading message? That was actually taken under scrutiny by the Supreme Court. We don't know. Like the thing is that the government is regulating this fact checking unit. What if we are actually putting up good data? thing against the government, it is actually anti-government but still which is actually giving us knowledge to the citizens. Even the government can put down that kind of data stating it as against the government or fake news. So the reliability of such fact checking units was actually questioned by the Supreme Court. So consider the following statements of the fact checking units were published by the Home Ministry of Home Affairs as I have told you no, it is published by the Ministry of IT and Electronics. The focus is to identify fake online content related to business of the central government. That's a correct statement. So statement 1 is incorrect but the statement 2 is correct here. Moving on to the last question in the polity session. <coughs> justice Malamata committee recommended reforms of which are the following. Our criminal justice system, banking system, judicial reforms and education system. Justice Malamata committee actually deals with the criminal justice system. Especially they put reforms for the police force. The thing is that recently Supreme Court accused the inter investigation officers that they have to let go of a convict because they are the investigation officers are not doing their work and they are not providing sufficient evidence because of which all the accused even if he is accused the person is accused the, uh, the court has to let that person go because there is lack of evidence. So the Supreme Court has been actually targeting the investigation officers and such. So under this the court actually also gives about recommendation of the Justice Malimata Committee which state that the police force should be divided into two wings. One should deal with the investigation office alone and the other should actually deal with the law and order. Now the the thing is that the present police force they actually deal with both. A single person will be dealing with the law and order as well as the investigation. Both the works are actually given to the very single person. Now because of which the police like there is other problems like there is they are understaffed, they are not actually reskilled and such. Upskilling is not there in the police force. Such factors are also there and at the same time all the law and order and all, uh, all the investigation everything comes under the head of one person. So because of which there is no big efficiency happening in the police. So that is another factor which has been actually mentioned in the news article which I have taken then. So Justice Malimata committee deals with the Indian criminal justice system and the police reform that has to actually take place because they are understaffed, there is upskilling needed. Also that the investigation should be more efficient so that the number of convicts in the court can be actually increased and all the evidence can be presented so the accused can be actually convicted. So that is actually stated under this Justice Malimata committee. So by, with, by this we have actually discussed the 9 important topics that are actually coming under the quality session. So from the economy part we have 5 topics to be discussed. So the first question is based on circular migration. So look at the question, circular migration refers to the repetition of illegal migration by the same person between two or more countries. To the circular migration depends upon the economic opportunities available for the person. In India the internal migration has always been circular. The circular migration does not allow multiple entry and exit between the source and the destination countries. So let us look into the concept of circular migration. So from the figure if you can see here, let us take this as the country A, country A and let us take this as the country B. Now country A I suppose I will put it like India, country B we can actually take it as US or UK. So if you are looking at the country India, we have some social disadvantages because, because of which we can see a lot of migration from India to US. There is brain drain happening because of the spin on because a lot of people are migrating from India to US. But thing is that in India still, the thing is that I am migrating to US. My family is still here, my friends are still here. So at one point of the time I should ha will have to come back from US to India. It's not like I am actually uprooting everything from India and traveling to US. My family, my friends, everything, us, everybody is still here. Thing is that even if I went to US, I will be bound to come back again because of some of the social advantages. Maybe I am working in US, maybe I may be in, in India working as some high commissioner to US because of which I may be made to travel from US and India back again and forth because of it the still thing is that my family is 
here i have some economic opportunity still available in india because i wish even if i go to us i'll be bound to come back to india again now that is the concept of circular migration in us you may have economic activity there may be rich opportunity because it's a very developed country you may have a lot of freedom you may have bigger career choices you might have earn more but still the thing is that you will come back to india again now that is the concept of circular migration you go from india to us then you go come back from us to india again by this concept by this method there is no brain drain happening you know the brain drain is all the brains from india is traveling abroad because they have the opportunities there and all the people who are actually educated leave india go that is the concept of brain drain but if you have a circular circular migration this brain drain won't happen now from india there might be brain drain from in the us when all the brains from india goes to us that is actually brain gain by this circular phenomena we can actually avoid this brain drain as well as brain, brain gain which means that both the economies will have get advantage of it eventually so that is the concept of circular migration now this is actually very legal and there is no restriction in the case of multiple entry and exit you can go to us however times you want you can come back to india how many times you want so there is no particular restriction in the case of uh, this circular migration and in concept other is that in india it's always a kind of circular migration you can see especially if in kerala you can see the bengalis and other people actually coming from west bengal assam bihar that kind of area to come and work in the southern india then when there is a break they'll actually go back to their families and such so that is a kind of circular migration happening even if i'm actually going to work in bangalore my family is actually still there in kerala so what do i do i work there when there is actually any kind of what we can say when there is actually any kind of break i get i'm coming back to kerala so whatever i'm going through is also a kind of circular migration so as you can see here circular migration is actually done by it's very legal it can, there is multiple point of entry and exit and in india we usually find circular migration so circular migration refers to repetition of not illegal but legal migration by the same person between two or more countries the circular migration depend upon the economic opportunities that is available for a person is a very neutral statement i can actually make that in india internal migration has always been circular that is the correct concept circular migration allow it is not doesn't it actually allows multiple entry and exit point between the source and the destination so we need to choose a number of incorrect statements so first statement and fourth statement is wrong so two statements only so i hope you understood the concept of circular migration moving on we have about the global corporate minimum tax it aims to stop the tax motivated profit shifting and tax base erosion by mncs presently the global corporate minimum tax is 20% on corporate profit recently eu tax observatory called for a global minimum tax on billionaires equal to 5% of their wealth thing is that recently the eu tax observatory has called for not 5% but 2% the thing is that they estimated that there is almost 3000 billionaires 3000 billionaires out there so if you are actually extracting 2% of their wealth which means that annually we might even actually get 250 billion dollars so that is how much we can actually generate if we are actually taxing 2% of the billionaires wealth there is almost 3000 billionaires in the global planet so not 5 percentage but it's 2 percentage and the global corporate minimum tax is not 20 percentage if you have known the basics it's actually 15 percentage so what is base erosion base erosion and profit shifting we can take us we can take maldives here an mnc has to be in us the mnc has to pay a minimum tax of 5% but if you are looking at maldives they have to pay only 0 or 0.5 percentage is more like tax free or it's a tax haven there is no particular tax which they have to actually the mnc particularly if you are taking google doesn't have to given maldives so what they see the thing is that in us if they are putting their company the base of their company in us they have to pay a lot of tax so the company what they does is they shift their base to maldives where it's a tax haven where they don't have to actually pay very big tax because of which when they are actually shifting their company the main mother country is actually losing all its profit and the maldive governments are getting a portion of it but still when if their tax is also pretty much very less they are also not getting anything because of which the mncs are actually gaining profit so the basic concept of a global minimum corporate tax is that these mncs will have to pay a minimum tax of 15 percentage to the mother countries and also the place of destination so these company does not actually hold up all their profits and also the mother nation gets their tax as due 
So the first statement is actually correct and as per 2021 the EU they have actually fixed the global corporate minimum tax as 15 percentage and now recently the EU tax observatory called for another 2 percentage tax on billionaires. Now this 15 percentage was corporate tax on MNCs. Now this particular is on the top of billionaires. So that is what this question has been dealing with. We have to choose the number of incorrect statements. So here two statements are wrong. So only two statements. Moving on. Consider the following statements about the National Financial Reporting Authority. The NFRA is constituted under the Companies Act of 2013. Its duties include recommending policies and standards to be adopted by the companies for approval by the central government. The thing is that if you are looking at the background, there was like PN, uh, Punjab National Bank scam. A lot of scam has been happening. So we needed a stronger authority, reporting authority, an audit mechanism at the center so that such kind of scams could be actually avoided. So that is why the National Financial Reporting Authority came in. The major, the, the major activity is actually audit regulator. They audit all the accounts, all the system, they monitor, they give out regulations to the government to make out how to avoid these kind of scams and such. So the main authority is actually avoiding such kind of scams and also audit. Recommend accounting and auditing policies. Then monitor and enforce compliance with accounting, oversee the quality of the service by the professional. These are also the functions of this national, this national finance reporting authority and it is actually constituted under the Companies Act of 2013. So both these statements are correct and here A, statement 1 and statement 2 are correct and statement 2 is the correct explanation of statement 1. Then consider the following statements about the green credits program. It allows an individual or an entity to earn green credits and trade it to a dedicated for a dedicated amount of exchange. It covers eight types of activities. Green credits generated by fulfilling any obligations in compliance with any law shall not be tradable. Select the number of incorrect statements. So we need to choose the number of incorrect statements from the above. So, the thing is that as I have told you, the green credits. The green credits refers to a unit of incentive that is actually provided by an effective activity. Basically me, I am actually uh, like planting a lot of plants. I actually planted about one crore plants. Now, more than this, I can actually exchange this for some kind of benefits or credit systems available. So that is actually the basic concept. But for that, you need to actually register in a system, register into that particular site. The people will actually come into a, a investigate the areas and how much you have actually produced, is it under any kind of obligation or law or did I do it voluntarily. So all this will be actually checked by that particular person who is actually coming in and registering. The thing here is that if you are actually planning all this in base of some obligation or law, the green credits is not applicable today. It should be actually voluntary. I am planning this one crore plans on my own. It is not based on some legislations or obligations or law. I am doing it voluntarily because I want to conserve the environment and such. I want to earn some green pro, uh, green credits out of it. That is the base possible base of this. So to get a green credit, one needs to register the activity with the administrator and then they will actually come and check to give us green credits. This program will cover eight type of activities are really covered here. <coughs> We have tree plantation, water management, sustainable agriculture, waste management, air pollution reduction and mangrove conservation and restoration. So these are all the eight activities that are actually covered under this green credit program. This green credit generated if procedure to fulfill any obligation in compliance with any law shall not be tradable. For such kind of green credits, uh, so for such kind of generation, the green credit is not actually transferable. So in here, all the statements are actually Correct here. To earn green credits and tradable on dedicated exchange, it covers eight type of activities and green credits in fulfilling any obligation in compliance is not actually tradable. So here, we will choose the intern. All the statements are correct. So none of the above is the answer here. So consider the last question of uh, economy. Middle income track recently mentioned in the news refers to a situation where the middle income countries become a high income country. A situation where a middle income countries experience recession and economic stagnation, a middle income, where a middle income country is unable to transaction into a high income economy, a situation where high income countries witness economic stagnation. Here basically middle income trap is actually a situation where a middle income uh, income country is unable to transition. We are looking at the example like India. We have been a low income country or upper income low middle income country 
So because of which we have been in that position for a long time and we are actually unable to transition into a higher economy because we have economic stagnation, there are some kind of recession, the COVID and everything, we are a slow growing economy because of all this a middle income country like India is actually not able to transition into a high income country. So that is what is actually mentioned in the middle income chart. So next we will be going on to the environment section. So coming on to our environment section. The first question deals with the glacial lake outburst flood phenomenon. So you know in Sikkim recently because of uh, the lakes, uh, Loktak lake actually blasting, uh, the glacial lake outburst phenomena happened in Sikkim. So th this is a type of flood that is typically caused by rapid melting of glaciers. Glove can be actually triggered by heavy rain or an earthquake. Synthetic aperture radar mentioning can detect changes in the water bodies and give early warnings about glove. So in here the thing is that all the three statements are actually cover correct here. So the thing is the flood of, because of the mel rapid melting of glaciers that is basically the definition of glow. It can be triggered by rain or earthquake and synthetic aperture radar imagery can actually detect glow. So here all the three statements are correct, we are actually incorrect. So all are correct here. Moving on we have a question about the national action plan for green shipping. The action plan is launched by the Ministry of Environment. It the central aim is to develop a regulatory framework and a road map for green shipping so that they can actually foster carbon neutrality and a circular economy. The Green Voyage 2050 project is a partnership project between the government of Norway and India aiming to transform the shipping industry towards a lower carbon, fee, carbon future. So here the action plan is not launched by the Ministry of Environment. It's a plan for the green shipping. So the Ministry of Ports and Shipping actually comes in. It's not based on the Ministry of Environment. And the main aim is to actually ensure carbon neutrality and attain circular economy. The statement too is actually correct. The Green Voice 2050 project is not between India and Norway. It is between the government of Norway plus international Meteorological organization, it's not India. India is not a partner in this green voice system. So we need to choose a number of correct statements. So here only one statement is actually correct here. So if you are looking, the national action plan for green shipping is to actually incentivize practices and low emission shipping. The, it helps position India in maritime sector as environmentally responsible. Such kind of thing will actually elevate India's position. And they will actually pivotal role of achieving about 20 trillion economy by 2047. This is actually launched by the Ministry of Ports and Shipping and Waterways. The Green Voice 2050 project is a partnership project between the government of Norway and international maritime organization. Moving on, consider the following statements about gangetic dosses. They can live in both fresh waters as well as salt water. As per IU, IUCN, they are actually vulnerable species. The thing is that they can actually only live in the fresh water, they cannot actually live in salt water kind of condition. And as per IUCN, they are actually not vulnerable, they are endangered. So this gadget dolphin species are actually very important from the prelims point of view. So it's very important that you actually learn their livelihood, they adapt to where they live and what their IUCN status. They are also protected under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act. So this particular species is altogether very important. We are actually choosing the incorrect statement. So here both 1 and 2 are the incorrect statements from here. Consider the following statement. Like what is the paintbrush swift recently that has been seen in news. So the paintbrush uh, is actually a rare butterfly which is actually spotted in the western Himalayas. 145 years ago this was actually spotted first. But there was no particular protograph or detailed discussions about this particular species of butterfly that has been recorded. But after 140 years since the first recording, we are actually witnessing or getting a photograph for the particular details about this paintbrush swift kind of butterfly species. So that has been actually in use and it has been located in the western Himalaya sector. Consider the following statements about Asiatic wild dog. The wild dog is also called as Dole. It is the only endangered wildlife living candid in the tropical Indian forest. Asiatic wild dog is also known as Dole or Mountain Wolf. They live in a small family unit. The first statement and second statement are actually correct here. They are the only endangered wild pack which is actually living in the Indian subcontinent or the Indian forest. They are also called as Dole or the 
mount and wolf as such. But these are small category of wolves, they don't live in small small unit, they are very large clan. They travel large, they eat large, they actually have a very large clan. So, so they are actually not a small family unit. We are asked to the number of incorrect statements, so here only one statement is incorrect. They are actually not small family units, but they are actually large clans living together. Then, only endangered wildlife living candid in the tropical forest. That is our, uh, that is our dhol or the mountain wolf for the Asiatic wild dog. They have high risk of uh, extinction due to the loss of the habitat and such. They are native to central, south and east, southeast Asia. They are, I, as per you seen, they are actually endangered and their habitat loss, prey availability is all living. They actually live in clans and uh, large clans are not small units. So, consider the last question of the environment section. The term Cornocarpus recently mentioned in news is what? It's a rare species in the western world. It's a native tree species, a small ornamental plant and plant with the medical properties. This is actually an invasive tree species that recently occurred in Gujarat. So, because of all the urbanization or the greening initiatives, certain kinds of invasive species was actually introduced. Because of it, certain species was introduced for ornamentation and for like greening the cities and such. But the thing is that the native trees got, th uh, their booming got rejected by these kinds of invasive species that are actually greening. This, con this cornocarpus is also called as button wood trees. Because of the introduction of these kind of invasive species, the native species are actually struggling to grow. So that is what the cornocarpus has been in news recently. So we actually cover the important topics under the environment section as well. So moving into international relations, we have the first topic, which of the following countries has a border with Israel? So because of the Israel and Hamas issue, we need to look into the background of Israel, what all activities are there taking place, which are all the bordering countries as well. So if you are looking at this map, you can see that Israel is actually bordered by Egypt, then we have Jordan, we have then Syria and also Lebanon. So these are then, this is actually marine border which is actually bordering the Mediterranean Sea. So four countries like Egypt, Jordan, Syria and Lebanon is actually bordering uh, Israel. Saudi Arabia is actually not bordering Israel. Then some of this is the map, this is the Gaza region that has been actually shown in news. This is the Gaza and this is the whole rest. If, if you are seeing in this ma map, this is the Gaza region. This is the actual West Bank region and you can see the presence of Dead Sea which actually lies in between Jordan and Israel in here. So that is the West Bank region and this is the Gaza region. This Gaza and enlarged is what you can actually see here. So all these black dots which you are actually seeing here is actually the boundary that is actually created by Israel. These are actually strategic walls that are actually raised by Israel. So only open border which Gaza has is actually in the, with the Egypt that is the Rafa crossing area which is only the open border that Israel, Gaza has all the rest of the area has been actually walled up by Israel as such. So there are important crossings which you need to know here. You have the Rafah crossing here which actually connects the Gaza and the Egypt region. Then we have the Kerem Shalom goods crossing area. Then we have the Erez crossing. So these are the three important crossing regions that which you need to know. And the Rafah crossing is the more important because it has been recently opened because of all the criticism that uh, Israel has been actually facing because Israel stopped the supply of foods, medicine, etc. to this Gaza area. So international community has been criticizing Israel because of it. They had to actually open up this Rafah uh, crossing so that the aid can actually go into the Gaza region from Egypt. So remember Israel which are the bordering countries and also the Rafa crossing and other crossing and also the area which is surrounding the Gaza city because this is area where the war is actually going on right now. So from the first question if you are seeing, so from the first topic which of the following countries has a border with Israel as I have told you Egypt has a border, Saudi Arabia doesn't has a border. Jordan, Syria and Lebanon. So only four countries has actually a border with Israel. Then as I told you the Rafa crossing which has been recently seen in news is connecting Gaza city and Egypt. Because all these kind of cities which are actually given you here is in the news recently. Like we have the talks that is going on between Bhutan and China. There is war happening between Armenia, 
that Armenia, Azerbaijan, there is actually tensions open there. Then Ethiopia, Eritrea, there are all tensions happening here. So because of which, you have to know which all place is actually connected to which all area. So the Rafa crossing is actually between Gaza city and Egypt. Then the recent rescue mission is actually Operation Ajay. Operation Ganga was actually Ukraine. Rescuing Indians from Ukraine. Now rescue, rescuing the Indians from Israel. Gaza area is Operation Ajay which has been actually recently given out by the Indian government. Moving on, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Now, this topic has been in news recently because Russia is stating that they will actually withdraw from this CTBT. So, let us look into the statement. CTBT was negotiated at the Conference of Disarmament in Geneva and adopted in the United Nations General Assembly in 1966. The treaty bans nuclear explosion for military only. Chi India, China, Russia and USA has ratified this treaty. The first statement is actually correct here. This was actually taken up in the United Nations General Assembly in 1966. But the thing is that the treaty does not ban only military. It also bans such kind of explosion, nuclear explosion for the civilian activities as well. India, China, Russia and USA had ratified this treaty. This statement is actually wrong. Certain nations had not ratified this treaty. USA has not ratified. India has not ratified. India has not even signed this CTBT. So, we will look that in the lesson from here you can see that only uh, one statement is correct. So, we have to choose the incorrect. So, here only two statements are wrong here. So, if you are looking into CTBT as I have told you, China, Egypt, Iran, Israel, USA have signed but not ratified this CTBT. China, Egypt, Iran. So, it is important that CDBT has been in use. So, you need to know certain states which have not signed, which are nuclear capable but have not signed it. India, North Korea and Pakistan has not even signed it and not even ratified it. Ratified means that the parliament of that particular country has actually made certain laws. Two by third of the majority has actually accepted and made laws regarding this banning of nuclear explosion. So, the thing is that China, Egypt, everybody have signed it but they have not actually ratified in their parliament and they have not created a law of their own. India, North Korea and Pakistan whereas they have not even signed it. Now, so far like 187 countries has actually uh, signed it and out of this 178 has actually ratified it, okay. 178 nation has actually already ratified it. But the thing is that the CTBT is still not in force. This comprehensive test nuclear ban treaty is still not in force. The thing is that 187 has signed it. 178 has ratified it, but why is still not in force? The thing is that when you are looking at the nuclear, uh, nuclear station, as per the annex, annex 2 of this the thing is that there are 44 nations which have nuclear capability, okay, 44 nations. But out of this 44, 8 nations have not still signed it and ratified it. It actually comes about all these nations should sign and ratify it. All the, the thing is that the nuclear nations should sign and ratify it. Then only if a treaty ban is actually made, it would be effective. All the other countries with, which has no nuclear capabilities are who are not developing nuclear capabilities capability, they are just coming and signing. The thing is that it will actually prevent them from development of nuclear technology in the future. But the thing is that people, the countries which already have this nuclear technology, some kind of ban should be put upon their testing. So if these countries are actually not signing it, the thing is that the thing is not going to be effective. Out of the 44 countries, 8, like the countries like China, Egypt, Iran, Israel, US, India, North Korea, Pakistan, these are acting nuclearly active states. If these states are not signing, if these countries are not signing, it mean, which means that the CTBT and all together doesn't have a big relevance of their own. So that is why the CTBT is still not in actually still not in force and the Russia is saying that Russia has already ratified it, they think uh, they are stating that they will de-ratify it and come out of this treaty as well, that is what the Russians are into it right now. In the early stage we had the limited test ban treaties and all this was signed in 1963 but the thing is that it actually allowed, uh, it, it did not mention underground testing, it actually banned testing in the air, water, atmosphere and such but not underground. So. The countries exploited it and started doing underground nuclear explosion test and all. Then we came the nuclear uh, non-proliferation treaty. That was also like was okay. Then after the Cold War has ended in 1991, the CTBT has actually come into force. Moving on, 
consider the following statements about the Moscow format. It is a dialogue platform on Afghanistan initiated in 2017 to actually promote regional peace and cooperation. There are nine members, but India and Tajikistan are actually not members. So let us look into this. So this Moscow format was actually initiated in 2017 on the question of Afghanistan. So they, the, it has been recently active so that they, they can actually undergo some humanitarian kind of activities in Afghanistan. They could actually ask the Taliban government, Taliban regime government to actually put some humanitarian uh, crisis, more equal rights to men and women. So all these kinds of ideologies can be actually pushed in by these neighboring members as such. <coughs> but the thing is that majority of it does not recognize Taliban as a legitimate government. So it becomes very important for its recognization as such. They actually demand Taliban so that they can actually truly form an inclusive government as such. It is a dialogue forum for Afghanistan which is initiated in 2017. Now the thing is that India is actually a member. All the thing, the, all there are six founding members. We have China, India, Iran, Pakistan, all the neighboring countries surrounding the Afghanistan region. We have Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, all the Central Indian countries except for Tajikistan. You should remember that. Tajikistan also has a border with Afghanistan but the thing is that Tajikistan is actually not a member of this Moscow format. There are nine members. We have all the neighboring countries of Afghanistan. We have India, China, Pakistan, Iran. Then the four. We have four of that. Then Russia. Then we have the four Central Asian countries not but does not include Tajikistan. We have Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. So in this we need to choose the correct statement. So from here you should know the first statement is correct but the second statement is actually wrong. Nine members are correct but India is actually a member. Tajikistan is not actually a member. So here only the first statement is actually correct here. Moving on. A recent issues have been actually happening between this Kosovo and Serbia. So we need to look at which all the countries not bordering this uh, bordering the Kosovo region. So you can see this is Kosovo. Not many countries actually recognize Kosovo as a separate country. They all recognize Kosovo as an integral part of Serbia. Thing is that the Serbs believe that Kosovo is their motherland. And they think that the Serbia actually emerged from Kosovo and they think it as their motherland. So Serbia wants Kosovo all to them. Sorry. But the thing is that here presently Kosovo only has 6% of the sum. 6% of the Serbian population. The rest are other category of people. So mainly it's actually kind of ethnic trouble or violence that has been actually happening in this place. So that is what the major ethnic issues that is actually happening between Kosovo and Serbia. From Serbia, Montenegro and North Macedonia are actually share a border. You can see Albania, this is North Macedonia, then Montenegro, Serbia, everything actually surrounds Kosovo but not Romania. So here the correct answer is Romania. Romania has no border with Kosovo, Serbia. This all becomes a part of Europe. So it's important you know the geography of it. Then consider the following statements about consular access. Thing is that recently you might have seen in news that eight Indian ex-Navy uh, captains or officers were actually in row four, hang to be dead in Iran. Kat, sorry, in Qatar. So because of that, this consular access becomes very important. It's just a terminology because the thing is that this case has been going on for a lot of time and now suddenly the Qatar government has stated that they have charged on espionage spy working on the Qatar. So because of the charge of espionage, they will be actually hanged to death. So that is why the consular access and the Indian mediation becomes very important. So that as per the Vienna Convention of Diplomatic Access and such, we can actually bring back the Indians so that they can actually undergo the life imprisonment or something in India but not in the Qatar jail. So as per the consular access, it is the ability for foreign nationals to access the consulate or embassy officials. Even if like I am in Qatar jail, I need to access my Indian embassy. So with the help of consular access, it will be, be I can actually get access to the Indian embassy or the other consular, consular officials in the Qatar region. So that I can actually get the legal provision so that I can fight my own case in Qatar. The thing is that the judicial system of Qatar will be very different from the judicial system of India. So I need a person who knows the judicial system of Qatar so that I will also have an equal chance in fighting my own case in a foreign country. So in that con in that condition this consular access becomes very important. The Vienna Convention also defines the framework for the consular access. As per the diplomatic relations, the consular access should be actually given as per the Vienna con Convention. Even if it's on espionage charge or murder, such kind of Consular access cannot be neglected by the foreign country. It outlines the rights and the privilege of the consular of officers who are also 
receiving this. India and Pakistan has also signed a similar agreement in 2008. Under this, the list of prisoners are actually extinguished every year from January 1st to Jan July, 20, uh, July 1st. So even India and Pakistan also have such kind of consular access, such kind of agreements are also shared. So that Indians in Pakistani jail and Pakistanis in Indian jail could actually get the consular access and the judicial benefits as such. So here, all the four statements are important. I just wanted to explain to you the ideology or the concept of the consular access. I explained everything to you in this one question itself. So here all the statements are actually correct. Consider the following statements about Global Hunger Index. It's an annual report that has been published by FAO. The GIH used four indicators, child wasting, child stunting, undernourishment, as well as child morality. The portion of BN is an indigenous tracker developed and deployed by the Ministry of Women and Child Development. We need to choose the incorrect answer. Thing is that this Global Hunger Index is not actually released by FAO, but it is actually released by the Concerned World Wife and Wealth Hunger Life. You might feel like FAO has, because it's a food and agriculture organization, it will give an insight about the Global Hunger Index as well, but it's no. The FA is, uh, Global Hunger Index is actually released by the World Wide and Wealth Hunger Life. In, they ranked India 1, 1, 1 out of 125. Now this further lowering the position of India compared to 107 out of 121 countries in 2022. Our, this, uh, our, what our rank has further dipped again. There are four components as we saw in the question. There is undernourishment, child stunting, child wasting as well as the child morality that comes into picture. The entire score is actually calculated in 100. If you have 0, it is actually 0 hunger and if you go to 100, there is severe hunger that is actually happening within the country. The, it's a European NGO that is concerned worldwide and wealth hunger life that actually gives out this. It's a European NGO. And they, it's an annual report. They publish the annual report and they take, uh, take about five years of data to actually consolidate this report and then release it. So the portion abhyan tracker is actually a monthly update of the condition of child nourishment, wasting, everything. Thing is that this particular report, it takes the data of five years, which is actually not very accurate. But the portion abhyan, which is actually under the Ministry of Women, uh, Women and Child Development, is more accurate and it actually gives more further result of the condition of hunger in India. So with that, with that portion of being tracker, India is in a much more reasonable position. There is no widespread hunger in India. But as per the global hunger index, our position is much more lower, showing we have severe kind of hunger situation that is actually present in India. So there is a lot of tussle that is happening in between here. So you should, you should know that the global hunger index is not given out by the concern worldwide and wealth hunger life. So with, because of it, the first statement is wrong. Second and third statement is actually correct. We need to choose a number of incorrect statements. Only one statement is incorrect here. Consider the following statements about the International Solar Alliance. The International Solar Alliance was jointly developed by India and Japan. The initiative includes only the tropical countries. The global stock trade report is released by the International Solar Alliance. So if you know the ISC was actually jointly released along with the Paris Agreement. This was actually came in 2015. This International Solar Alliance is to actually bring up all the countries with solar potential so that they can actually develop this kind of solar energy and get much more cleaner energy and attain the target of uh, like uh, 2030 car uh, carbon neutrality and such can be actually attained or, and achieve the SDG goals of 2030. Thing is that the International Solar Racing was not developed by India and, India and Japan but by India and France. And the initiative includes only tropical countries. This was initially. Initially there was only tropical countries so because they have get the direct sunlight and such and this solar power initiative can be actually easily taken up in this tropical countries. Later this was expanded to uh, expanded to include a lot of other countries and organizations. Presently this has about 116 country members as such. The global stock trade report is actually released by ISA. In the November coming month we can actually see the report being actually released by the ISA. So when the report is re released in the November next month then we can actually come to know major detail about this global stock trade report. So we need to choose the number of correct answers. So here only one statement is correct. The first statement is wrong. The second statement is also wrong. Okay, only one statement is correct. <coughs> Consider the following statements about the Indian Ocean Rim Association. So this has been in news recently because of the new chair who is going to take place. It is an intergovernmental organization aimed at strengthening regional cooperation and sustainable development 
within the Indian Ocean region, India is a present change of Iora. So you can see here, this is the Indian Ocean countries. This, there are actually 23 members plus nine dialogue partners. So you can see all the dialogue partners that are in the red and all the membering countries, all the countries members are the countries that are actually surround the Indian Ocean. This is the Indian Ocean and these are the countries. You can see the African coast countries. You can see the Omanian area countries. You can see India. You can see the Southeast Asia region. Then you can see Australia as well. So there is totally about 23 members in this IORA as well and actually 9. Uh, dialogue partners. So the IRA identifies six priority areas here: maritime security, trade, fishing, uh, fishing uh, management, then disaster risk, then cooperation, tourism promotion, and cultural exchange. All are some of the six priority areas under this. There are 23 members, nine dialogue partners, and formed in 1997, and ha has its sec secretariat at Mauritius. So that is what is IORA is. But currently. The chair is actually going to be Sri Lanka, but the current chair is not India, but Bangladesh. Bangladesh has been chair for two years. So two years, two years, the chair actually keeps on changing. The last chair for Bangladesh and it is actually going to be taken by Sri Lanka presently. So here only statement one is correct. Okay. The global gender gap report is released by which of the following? We have the World Economic Forum, UNCTAD, World Health Organization and UN Movement. This is also a previous year question. So you should know the global gender gap report is actually released by the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum actually releases the global gender gap report. Now because of all the issues that has been happening here, also the Claudia Goldman's work on the women development over the years, so because of it, this global gender gap report becomes very important and you should know the, the organization that releases it, that is the World Economic Forum. Ashokanj recently seen in news is located which on the following. So you can see Ashokanj here. Recently, Bangladesh has actually built a memorial in honor of the 19th 71 soldiers who has actually died in the Bangladesh Liberation War. So they actually constructed a memorial for the Indian in honor of the Indian soldiers in Ashikanj. Now this Ashikanj is recently close to the Indian border which is actually bordering Tripura. So this Ashikanj is actually relatively close to India. So this is the place where Bangladesh has been actually constructing the memorial. This is not a new idea. It has been in development for a lot of stage and it is actually in the conclusion closing phase. Now we can see the inauguration in the coming few months. So Ashikanj is in actually Bangladesh. Consider the following statements about the Belt and Road Initiative. Recently, the BRA Third Summit has actually taken place in China. So regarding this, we need to know what is the Belt and Road Initiative. It is a massive infrastructure and economic development project by China. It has two main components. There is a Silk Road as well as a Maritime Silk Road. Right? Silk Road that has been given out. Then Hambantota Port, China Maldives Friendship Bridge, Gawadar Port are some of the important infrastructure development that has been undertaken by China under BRI. Then it aims to connect the East Asia economic region with the European economic circle. It runs across the continents of Asia, Europe and Africa. The thing is that as per the BRI, BRI actually came force in 2010. So since then we have been hearing of the Belt and Road Initiative by China. So under this, all these statements are actually correct here. There is nothing to be taken away from. All these are actually correct statements. You know the debt trap diplomacy and all the uh, things that has been actually happening because of the BRI. All the countries who are actually accepted BRI, BRI has been debt trapped and is under the Chinese government right now. So under that BRI becomes very important. It connects the silk, there is two routes, there is silk road as well as a maritime route that is actually in place. <coughs> Consider the following statements about the WHO regional committees. So, WHO, WHO regional committee has been there in news recently. So, we need to look into that. So, there are six regional committees for WHO. India is a regional member of WHO Southeast Asia and its regional office is actually located in New Delhi. There are eight flagship priority areas for WHO Southeast Asia. India has successfully eliminated yours while Sri Lanka and Maldives has eliminated Malaria. So let us look into who region committee. There are actually six region committees for who and India becomes some is a member of the Southeast Asia region. Also the region committee secretariat is actually for the Southeast Asia is actually located in India. The thing is that all the regions they have different different uh, 
uh, reasons like in india we are in tropical area we have like diseases like malaria we have yawns we have like uh, we have a lot of other kind tb and kind of such which is actually priority area for us whereas these priorities might be the same for the other regional groupings so the entire world is actually divided into six kind of regional grouping and particularly in southeast asia we have eight kind of flagship flagship priorities we have the measles and rubella rubella elimination preventing of non communicable diseases we had reduce the maternal and unified neonatal mortality rate the universal health coverage combating antimicrobial resistance scaling up the capabilities of emerging risk management eliminating of tb as well as accelerating efforts to end tb so these are the eight key priority areas of the southeast asian region so if you looking under this there has been a lot of like uh, achievements we achieved so far malaria sri lanka and thailand bangladesh has eliminated lymphatic filariasis india has been yaws free nepal myanmar eliminated trachoma sri lanka maldives eliminated malaria thailand maldives sri lanka also eliminated mother to child transmission of simples as hiv then bangladesh bhutan nepal thailand has also achieved hepatitis control b so a lot of data is actually given but the thing you should need to know that india and the closest neighbors so india you should remember that we are yours free or also india's critical neighbors like bangladesh sri lanka bhutan also we should remember their data as well on what kind of diseases they have been completely eliminated so because of which this particular data becomes very important so please take a screenshot of the site and it becomes a very important for your future exams where you can actually quote these kinds of elimination in the case of disease sector or if you get a specific question on who or also for the prelims like you saw the question earlier this also becomes very important so as per the following statements about who regional committee there are six regional commission that's the correct statement india's region india is actually a regional member of who southeast asia and the office is actually located in new delhi there are eight flagship priority areas and also india has successfully eliminated yaws sri lanka and malaria has eliminated malaria so all the four statements are actually correct here so with this we are actually ending the international relations sec uh, section